Deltarune is the dark, epic fantasy video game made by Toby Fox. This ambitious seven-chapter game is still in development, but it has already given us a lot to chew on with just two chapters. Videos dot YouTube with all kinds of theories about what is actually happening within the game's story and what will transpire in future chapters. Yet despite all of that, despite all this coverage, there is still loads within Deltarune's story waiting for us to mine out and talk about. In this video, I want to address some of the background stories playing out in Deltarune that will very likely all come together to culminate in a grand finale capping off the amazing world building and character arcs that Toby has been weaving into this story. Hi there everyone, Lars here with a long overdue Deltarune follow-up analysis and theory video brought to you by Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And no, I am not going to tackle the question of whether or not Ralsei is evil in this video. My reasoning for that? This fluffy boy deserves special consideration and his own analysis video because he is a key component in the entire story. He's one of the main characters for crying out loud. And what I have discovered in my playthroughs of this game and in my research concerning him is honestly really, really big. And this video was already going to prob probably be long enough. <laughs> so I just remember how my analysis of just a few friendships in the game went for well over an hour? Yeah, that happened. <laughs> so without burying the lead any further, let's dive into the five background stories that I see playing out in Deltarune already with just chapters one and two. Story number one, Chris is possessed by two, yes, count them, two entities. The player, and the second one, is very likely Chara from Undertale. And yes, I'm going to say Chara instead of Kara because that's just the way that I see it right there. My pronunciation of names is weird. That's what happens when you're bilingual. Weird things tend to happen. So moving on to the second story I see unfolding. The Dark World that we were introduced to in Chapter 1, right at the very beginning, was created by Gerson, and it was also explored and later abandoned by his son, Alvin. Father Alvin. Yeah, Ooh, that's going to be a fun one. Story number three. The knight is someone that we know in town and is very likely someone connected to Father Alvin. Story number four. Gaster is pulling all of the strings in a vast experiment regarding determination. And yes, I am going to talk about Gaster. I understand he's the boogeyman of the Deltarune community. There's a whole lot of people who are like, anything that's weird, it's Gaster's doing. No, it's not always Gaster's doing. In fact, actually, what we see here playing out is that he's not in control, as a lot of people would think, but he is, however, present. He is someone who is indeed playing part in the dark, inevitable fate for this world, and he's just kind of getting his kicks and giggles, learning stuff as he allows us, Chris, Susie, Ralsey, and everyone else, to just kind of march to their doom. But that is still actually something very important for us to understand with how the game might end. Then finally, the fifth story that we see playing out, and this was definitely introduced in the most recent chapter, chapter two, is what happened to Des. Whatever Des's fate was, is absolutely critical to the fate for all of hometown. And whatever dark, messed up fate she experienced will be if effectively what determines what's going to happen to hometown. So those are the five stories right there. But before I perform my deep dives into each one of these darker background tales, let's quickly contemplate. Why does any of this matter? Why should we care that these smaller tales are playing out, that these theoretical elements are there within the game? I mean, the game is pretty big and expansive in and of itself. Most of the people care more about the central characters. So why should I worry about these things playing out in the background? Well, first of all, all five of these stories I've listed out right here are elements of the horrific, deeper, darker stories that make up this epic because Deltarune is most certainly epic storytelling. It easily stands right there on the same stage as other epic fantasy stories. However, these five stories are not 
the focus. If they were, Toby's main goal, which is that everyone would become friends with each other, would be ultimately a detriment to the story. Because how can you tell a heartwarming, humorous tale about friends becoming friends with everyone else in hometown if these five storylines played front and center? It would be a narrative mishmash. It would be crazy. You can't do it because they are too incompatible to share equal amounts of time. But to drive home the deeper message of why friendship is so powerful and so important and what it can mean to overcoming the personal darkness in our own lives, you need to have these darker stories playing out in the background. They need to act as seemingly insurmountable obstacles for the characters to overcome and thereby grow as they proceed on their overall plot and personal character arcs. Consider this for example. Chris and the player need to have a reconciliation at some point, and that will be absolutely monumental to this whole theme of friendship and understanding one another in order to achieve the ultimate ending of Deltarune. But if I am correct that there's actually two entities controlling Chris, then that begs the question, could someone like Chara be redeemed by friendship? Because friendship seems to be that power that's supposed to overcome everything else within this game. Well, the answer to that is probably 99.9% .9 no, because sometimes relationships go very, very bad. I mean, just look actually within game at the Snowgrave route and see what happens there. Because we as the players can take advantage of a toxic relationship to manipulate and terrorize Noel in order for us to gain power, which is a very Chara-like thing to do. And the wording within Snowgrave actually reflects that. It's kind of messed up. But this still ties into the greater message that Toby is communicating throughout his game, because we clearly see the horrors birthed by not trying to make friends with everyone and instead seeking out a more selfish route. And well, since I've already brought up Chris and their relationship with the player and the fact that there might be two souls inhabiting this poor teen's body, let's dive into a full analysis. All right, so the concept of two souls within Chris's body is going to sound really strange because, well, how on earth is that supposed to make sense? Who's actually then controlling Chris? Well, within game, there's a whole lot going on here to actually support that there are indeed two entities who are controlling this poor kid, us and another more nefarious entity. When we begin playing the game, we are working together with Gaster. And yes, this is Gaster right here. This isn't some sort of machine or whatnot. The wording, the way that everything is, the speed, the, the, the monotony of the voice, even though we don't hear the voice, the way that it is typed out, the way it's animated, very clearly denotes what we've learned of Gaster from Undertale. Very slow of speech, very precise, very elegant, and very much to the point. So we are indeed, as the player, working with Gaster to take control of a body, of a vessel, as he then inserts us into the world of Deltarune to basically play out his whatever weird game and experiment is in a world that is doomed to die. However, after we have laboriously worked through putting together our vessel with Gaster's assistance, that body is stripped away from us, and a different person begins speaking. Someone who is definitely not as well educated, someone who uses a completely different form of speaking, and also a different font, which is very similar to Chara's. Chara's style, Chara's font, comes on through and tells us that no one gets to choose who they get to be in this world, and instead, we are going to be forced into the body of Chris. So, suddenly now, Gaster's experiment is already going off the rails, and now we are in Chris's body. Now then, one of the things that I've seen a lot of people say is that it's just us and Chris, and that Chris is a highly demented, messed up kid who basically needs us almost in a way to function in any sort of good, appropriate way. However, I do not agree with that. Especially because when we look at what happens here with Chris, 
Granted, we control a lot of what Chris does. However, there are definitely moments where Chris does things that we have no control over, like the look of shame as Toriel leads them into the school. You can tell that Chris does not enjoy having their hands held by Toriel. And on top of that, Chris does move around on their own without us deciding to move them. There are times that they do this, such as going to class, backing away from the dark world as we as we enter into the closet. And probably one of the most notable moments is when Chris breaks our control and rushes in to save Susie from King. So Chris does have a certain sense of autonomy. And each time that Chris does something that is not of our control, they move really normally. They move at a decent speed. There's no weird wonkiness, edginess, or flopping about. Anything like that. Chris moves around fairly well on their own. On top of that, we are actually not in control of how Chris says things. True, we are the ones who determine what kind of actions Chris will take, if Chris is going to flirt or fight or say something, but we are not in control of how Chris actually does any of these things. You can especially see this in all the different kinds of battles where, I mean, I, if I were going up against really most of these characters, I wouldn't think to flirt or to lecture, or to convince, or to dance. Those are things that Chris is basically coming up with, and we just decide whether or not we're going to make Chris do that or not. And we have no control over the conversations that Chris has, other than to either make them talk or not talk at all, which will have a certain impact on Chris as an individual. So there's definitely a relationship of some sort between us, the player, and with Chris. And that's going to be a big element later on in the story. However, and this is something really, really big right here, there is that other entity. And we can actually tell when this entity takes charge is when Chris starts moving in a way that is very, very inhumane. Almost really more zombie-like than anything else. This weird hunched over, m shuffling, at a really, really slow, uh, deliberate pace. And all of their movements are jerky, like like robotic and not even in the sense of I am a robot I just do these simple functions but as in someone who is actively fighting against something that is using their body as a marionette Chris does not like the player controlling their life but they especially do not like whatever other entity is there they are fearful of this other entity that is using them. They are scared of going to sleep. They are scared of entering the dark world. They are scared of doing certain things. And there are things that are being blocked by this other entity. There are certain choices that we as the player would probably like to make, but there's another entity that seems to be blocking them. Like in chapter two. In chapter one, we got to have fun in the bathroom, but in chapter two, yeah, not so much. Because this other entity seems to be having some sort of a plan. And for that entity to be in any, in any kind of way in complete control, they have to remove us, the player who is a soul, take us on out and put us somewhere else where we cannot interfere. And in fact, we can see, especially in chapter one, that the soul can still move around after being ripped out of Chris. This again displays our own power of autonomy, but that we actually only have as much power in that we are connected with Chris. This other entity, however, has way more power, but has to fight against Chris wholeheartedly in order to get things done. Now then, the obvious comeback to this particular theory is, well, why doesn't Chris struggle against us? The answer actually is, they do. They do struggle against us. In fact, actually, if you as the player decide, you know what, I'm going to go after this secondary boss in Chapter 2. You're going after Spamton. Little do you know, you are actually being manipulated by Chris because Chris is looking for a way to cut the strings of connection that we and this other entity hold over them. Chris is definitely playing their own game. So they do resist us. If there's any reason why we might not have face as much interference or uh, resistance from Chris, remember that Gaster was working specifically with us in this crazy experiment to completely take over a vessel. And in this case, it was Chris. Instead, this other entity, however, shoved us 
in this experiment into Chris and is basically piggybacked off of this. And honestly, again, this all makes sense right here that this is most likely Chara. Let's consider, for instance, that the prophecy of how the world is going to end involves angels' heaven. We know from Undertale that there is this angel who's going to free all of the monsters, either by liberating them or by liberating them from their flesh. And if you go the genocide route, you basically become possessed by the angel Chara in their quest to destroy everything. And their version of perfection isn't just simply the death of all monsters, it is the destruction of the world. So right here, Chara is doing what Chara would always do. And if you play through Undertale multiple times doing the genocide route, Chara actually holds conversations with you about, well, aren't you a messed up one? We're going to be friends forever as we constantly destroy worlds again and again and again. This is just what Chara does. As an interdimensional time-jumping being, they can do this if they are given a host. And as opposed to Undertale, where your decisions determine whether or not Chara basically accompanies you to the very end and ends up taking over you as the or taking you over and basically <laughs> making you into a host. In this case right here, Chara's already jumped aboard ship and becomes a villain that we have to deal with as we play throughout the game. Again, just kind of make note of the things that happen here when Chris removes the soul from their body the way that they move, what they're doing. Everything is incredibly calculated. What we know about Chris is that Chris is, Chris is intelligent, but they're not that smart. They are goofy. They are fun loving. They like to pull pranks. But what we see right here when this other entity takes a hold of Chris, it's not prank mode. It's sinister. It's disturbing. And this particular being, especially at the end of chapter two, is basically setting a trap. They are playing a very, very dangerous game and opening up this dark fountain. A lot of people have said, well, that's just Chris wanting to fulfill what Susie desires, which is bringing, the both, bringing both worlds together to have all their friends be together. But if that were actually the case, why then is Chris doing this at their home slashing tires so that way Susie can't go anywhere and opening up the door so that way anyone who comes in to check on the dreamers will get sucked into this nightmare because it is indeed a nightmare. Everything that's going on here at the end of chapter two is very planned. It's very deliberate. And wow, that's why I do, definitely do believe that this is another entity who is playing their own game, namely Chara, playing the game of destroying the world of Deltarune. Now, that does not mean that Chara is the knight. Doesn't mean that. It could end up being the case depending on how things turn out, but I will get to that little bit of speculation and theorizing in just a moment. All right, so I want to go over a bit of the story that I just, wow, when I finally realized this, it blew my mind. I thought it was awesome. It brought so many little elements together. I was like, Holy cow, Toby Fox, you rascal, this is amazing. And that is this, Garrison Boom has a massive influence on the Dark World. In fact, he might be one of the very first people, at least that we know of in hometown, who went on over. Now then, to set this up, let's quickly look at some things right here. So first of all, references to Gerson are all over the place in chapters 1 and 2. We know that he wrote all kinds of books. This guy was an intellectual. He was a researcher. He's a historian. He's a teacher. He also wrote a whole bunch of just really fun fantasy stories. This guy was doing a whole lot right here. And when we go to the... Uh, when we go on over to the graveyard in chapters 1 and 2, we realize that there is a bench, a monument to Gerson that you can go and you can hang out at. And there's a neat little plaque just saying right here that he liked to sit out there, basically fall asleep and imagine things, dream, and that stories would come to him. And that he had written these amazing stories based on these adventures that he had had while being out there in the woods. This is really neat right here because chances are he was headed on over to the Dark World and that he most likely brought 
his son Alvin along. Now, the way that we know this is that if you go and you talk to Father Alvin in chapter 2, he reminisces a little bit about his father. When you leave, after talking to Father Alvin, you'll actually overhear part of a conversation that he's having with his dad, asking if it is okay for this boom to take up the hammer once again. And that was the title, or basically the premise of the stories that Gerson was writing for his fans. A story of a mystical hammer and the adventurers that were that surrounded this particular story. And we can basically infer that Father Alvin also went to the Dark World because when we actually wake up from, uh, from the Dark World in Chapter 1 and we find Chris and Susie in the unused room, there is a faded painting of a turtle monster that was made by Alvin. Alvin was there. These toys and everything are things that Alvin, that Alvin played with. These are the Leitner world representations of the world that Alvin had been in. Very likely, Gerson took Alvin to the Dark World on an adventure and basically passed off the hammer to him. It was all like, go forth and do, my son, have some amazing adventures. And Alvin most likely brought along friends. There were adventures that were had here in this world. There's a long fabled history. We know this thanks to Sham, who tells us just about as much. And also, when you pay attention to some of the dialogue, you realize that the pawn men had a boss other than the card kings. There is a lot of history, especially to the first uh, area of the Dark World that we're in in Chapter 1. It reaches back really, really far, and King, the evil king uh, himself, is upset because they were abandoned. And that makes absolute sense when you realize there's probably two generations of monsters who came to the Dark World, did, had amazing adventures here, and then left! Abandoned them! Not only simply abandoned them, but something awful happened. When you go to the Dark World in Chapter 1, where Chris and Susie are at, this, this place is decaying. It is dead. It is abandoned everywhere else in the Dark World. The, the, the abandoned town that Ralsei's in doesn't show that at all. Yet this area on the outskirts, at the void, the void, there's nothing out there. That is where we see the remnants of something ancient, something that once was it's gone. It's been destroyed. And if you pay attention to the etchings on the walls, we've seen that stuff already. Or I should say, we will see that stuff again. We see it in Chapter 2 when Ralsei is explaining what the roaring is. Then these titans will be unleashed. There's some similarities, some very creepy similarities between this rotting, decaying edge of the Dark World and what we see the roaring to potentially be, what we know it will be by the end of the game. So what can we then begin to infer? Well, Gerson went to the Dark World. He had adventures there, and he wrote a story based off of those adventures and became a world-famous author as a result. He brought his son on over to the Dark World, and his son Alvin had adventures there. However, Alvin dropped that hammer. And not in the sense of we're going to drop the hammer on this relationship and say goodbye, we're breaking up. Though maybe in the case we could say that's the case, that that's actually what happened because Alvin broke up with the Dark World, abandoned it, abandoned the Darkners, leaving King to feel absolutely betrayed and abandoned, and then deciding, screw this, I am going to just do things my own way, and we're going to and we're going to rebel against the Lightners. And this is done in part thanks to the knight who comes and helps to establish a brand new fountain in this kingdom which empowers king and disrupts the balance between light and dark and will bring on angels heaven and the roaring. Now then, we know, again, when we go back into the history, Jevil went insane. He originally wasn't. He was a, he was a friend and a compatriot to Sham, and they both served the kings of this, uh, of this old kingdom, and yet Jevil went insane upon the knowledge that the Dark World is effectively a game, or whatever this world is, Deltarune is, they understood, we're in a video game. And this broke Jevil's mind, and Jevil began to destroy things until he could be imprisoned by the other champions. 
And this could very likely be around the time that Alvin and his buddies abandoned the Dark World. And that would definitely help to emphasize the fact that we have been betrayed. Also, it would then begin to support even more so that the Knight is someone who knows Father Alvin. It was very likely a part of this adventure and as such knows that the Dark World, at the very least, if not everything, is a game. So, before I start diving into the Knight, we guns again, we have to understand that Gerson and his son Alvin had an absolute influence, a personal influence on the Dark World, that they had their own adventures there. And that for whatever reason, those adventures were abandoned. Alvin gave up whatever powerful hammer his father had and left it behind. And he's wondering if he can pick it up again. We don't fully understand yet what's going on here with that story. But rest assured, whatever went on with Father Alvin, that is going to come back into play later on in the story. That hammer that Gerson had is going to become important. Have we potentially seen this hammer already? I don't think we have. I really don't think we have. So, I'm sorry, Malice is not the hammer, most likely. Even though that would be really cool, but most likely not. It's probably another item altogether that could be very, very important for the team going on down the road. And because these people, these monsters, had been there in the Dark World before, there are adventures, there are stories there for us to discover, and we still don't understand exactly why an edge of the Dark World was crumbling, decaying, and dead at the edge of of the void, which is the void that the angel wishes to bring. So let's start diving here into the identity of the knight. Now then, like coming back to what I said previously about how Char is most likely not the knight, well, there are some things that we can puzzle out right here because I do believe that Gaster and Chara, as well as Sans and Papyrus are individuals from Undertale, from the other game, from the other timelines, who have indeed come on over to this one to interfere, to interact. That is something that we're going to have to discover. I know that Toby Fox said that this is not some alternate timeline of Undertale, and that's true. It absolutely isn't. It doesn't matter how you played Undertale. That ending is the same, no matter how you left it, because those beings, these four, can all jump around the different timelines and would therefore be able to end up in a world like Deltarune. So, let me dive a little bit into, into who the knight could potentially be before we start talking about whether or not Char is or isn't the knight. The reason why I do not think that Char is the knight and that it's most likely someone else is because, remember again, Alvin, Father Alvin, went very likely went into the Dark World and had adventures there, and most likely with some friends. Because Sham refers to multiple Lightners having come through once upon a time, not just one, but multiple. And so they had their adventures, but someone, someone told, someone told Jevil, this is all a game. It's all make believe or whatever, and it broke Jevil and began to, and which caused him then to wreak havoc across the kingdom. Around that time is when Alvin stopped coming to the Dark World, and so whoever the knight is is someone of a similar age, right there. So we can begin to rule out, I think, certain characters. We can rule out Toriel. Uh, we can rule out Asgore. We can rule out Rudy and his wife. Um, even though I think it would be really, really neat to see that it's actually the mayor of the town who is causing all of these problems, but I highly, highly doubt that. Instead, it will be one of the older characters uh, there in this world. And that really rules out a lot of individuals. What that means is that it's one of these little side characters who we don't really know much about, uh, or it could be someone who's dead. <laughs> We don't exactly know just here. Someone who could potentially be faking their death. Uh, once again, this is really, really hard to figure out right here. But chances are, the knight is someone who is older. Someone who is Father Alvin's age. And because we don't fully yet know 
the story of Father Alvin and everything that happened in the dark world from his point of view. That's probably why we can't actually definitively say who the knight is, because the knight is very likely someone who is connected to those old adventures and understands how the world works. Because where did this individual come from? Opening up a dark fountain. And we know it has to be a lightener because the lighteners are the ones who can open up dark fountains. The darkners can't do that on their own. They need the assistance of a lightener to do that. That's something that we learned distinctly from Queen. We also know that Queen's Dark Fountain did not come through an alliance with the Knight as it happened with King and the Knight. What this would then suggest is this, is that the Knight returned to the school to go back to the place, the one place that they definitely knew that the Dark World was, opened up that fountain, created the imbalance, and has since then gone and started opening up other dark fountains around town, disrupting the balance right here. This balance that Gaster and Chara and other individuals are all taking interest in, either to take advantage of it to destruction or to learn something, or maybe they're like Sands and they're stepping on in to observe or maybe even to help. Who actually knows? Right now, this is still the evolving mystery. We're only two chapters in, and Toby's not going to display his entire hand all at once. But because we we are pretty much guaranteed that Gerson and Alvin both went to the Dark World, and that was likely a friend of Alvin's who went on over there, that the Knight is an older individual who went back and has begun to access uh, the Dark World, starting first in the school, and has begun to move on. And maybe we'll find out in... Uh, in later chapters that there's a little bit more to this and maybe there's some strategy because the third dark found that we're going to face in chapter three was definitely not created by the knight or at least very likely wasn't because we see that that was a possessed chris who was doing that so very likely the knight is someone who's connected directly to father alvin which is why again i don't really believe that it's chara but you know what for the sake of argument let's actually engage in this conversation Let's say that the knight is Chara, which again begins to defy some of the logic that we see in how everything is playing out. This would effectively mean that a limping dragon Chris has been going around all over town, pulling off crazy shenanigans and miracles, and, is, and that Chara is basically in control of this crazy 4D chess game that is also at the same time helping people to become friends? That does not sound like a Chara character, which is why I don't really buy into this. But again, let's say that this is indeed the case, that this is, a Chara is indeed the knight. Well, because Deltarune is not an exact copy of Undertale, and we can't even say that Gaster or Sans or Papyrus or Chara are exactly the people that they were over in Undertale, because again, Toby Fox has said that this isn't a copy of that game, then what if, and this would then make everything really fit together really nicely, what if the Chara of this world was another human who was friends with Alvin? And one of the reasons why we might be able to run with this, though again, I might not really buy into this theory much, but it's something that we can run with right here. Gerson studied humans. How could he have done that if there were no humans to be around? So Gerson spent time with a human, a human who was friends with his son Alvin, and a friend who likely went with Alvin to the Dark World and had adventures with Alvin there. That would then account for multiple Lightners who were going through the kingdom. And that human is dead, is gone becoming a disembodied spirit and through some sort of weird way, then possessing Chris and knowing what this knight knows, whatever the knight's end game is, which seems to be total destruction, is then going around possessing the body of Chris to go open up the dark fountains in order to upset the balance, bring about angels, heaven, and the roaring, and destroy everything. So it would work. It makes logical sense. Again, I don't really buy too much into this particular theory simply because... We know that Gaster is indeed part of this game. So let me jump into the part of the boogeyman right here. Gaster. Again, I understand people get upset when they're like, you're just using Gaster to explain everything. 
In this case, I'm not. In this case, I'm not. In fact, if anything, I think Gaster's probably a little bit peeved at having his experiment hijacked by someone else. Why go through all this effort to create a vessel and to fuse it with the player to then suddenly completely discard that vessel? It's not the way Gaster works. Gaster, as we know him to have done in Undertale, used the bodies of his fellow monsters into the dust, into mush. He was willing to go into just dark, dark realms of all kinds of possibility. This guy does not waste. This guy is thorough. Now then, how can Gaster be here? Well, we know that Gaster basically lost his body, became a disembodied spirit, and was scattered across all space and time, but retained a core of consciousness through which he's able to communicate with others. He communicated with Alphys and very likely with Sans, or at least with someone else, within the true laboratory. And we know that it's him who's speaking to us. So Gaster has some sort of investment here. Now then, through the tweets from Toby Fox, where he basically lets Gaster speak through him, we know that Gaster has a whole new experiment in plan right here. He's still playing around with determination because it is our power of determination that ultimately bends the story to our women will. We have control over Chris and over how a lot of things play out. The reason why Gaster would honestly take a lot of interest in this particular world is because this is a world that seems to be ruled by some sort of hand of fate. Things are going to happen. No matter what our choices are, certain things are bound to happen. And Gaster is taking advantage of that. Again, one of the reasons why I believe that the Knight is actually a separate entity and not Chara. Because Gaster's looking at this and realizes the Knight... Hidden, under, hidden behind a veil of secrecy, is able to do whatever he or she wants in order to bring about the end of this world. And on top of that, the choices and decisions of other characters are ones that we can absolutely not control. So even though we have great determination and we can do what we want within the confines of the story, beyond the confines of that story, events and individuals are pressing in on us, determining the ultimate fate of each chapter. No matter what you do, whether you go complete genocide slash snow grave route, or if you are the nicest person on the face of the earth who wouldn't even step on an ant, the story still ends that way each and every chapter, railroading us to whatever end Toby has in mind. Gaster knows all of this. And what then would be a better opportunity to experiment with determination than to be in a world where determination seemingly doesn't matter? This is really, really cool. This guy's going to learn a whole lot right here. This is one of the best experiments. And it's an experiment that he really doesn't have to be that much involved with. He comes in, he's engaged in certain places. He is still experimenting with us as the player if we are willing to go looking for the Easter eggs. That's why he gives us an egg if we find him and continues on. And we'll see how things play out in the long run. Gaster isn't there to determine how the story ends. He's definitely not in control of the different characters' motivations or choices. He's just watching everything. He's observing, and at certain points, he intervenes, not to give us any sort of help, but just to see what will happen as a result of that determination, of that interference, and if there's any sort of way in which, in which the fate of this world can be averted which he probably is like it doesn't really matter to me i'm a disembodied spirit no matter what i'm just a core of consciousness i really only have knowledge to gain from all this so he doesn't need to actually play any sides and that makes him a very curious character within all of this and again kind of lends itself to maybe asking okay well then why even involve him because if that's the case he's then just still the boogeyman why even worry about gaster well here's the thing because part of this story is still about determination. And determination definitely ties into making friends with everyone. Toby said he wants us to become friends with everyone within the game if we decide to do that, which is actually a tall order considering how Chris is an outcast, how Susie is an outcast, and it does take some work. It definitely does take some work to get through these chapters and to bring out the best in these different characters or to bring out the worst. 
So Gaster wins by watching all this. He represents, he represents the the overall theme right here of determination and how it can be wielded for good or for ill which seems like a repeat of undertale however in this case right here it's made so much more personal through the character arcs that are playing out another thing that gaster has however done where we can see his interference is in what happened to the kids way back when we know that gaster has a bunker out in the woods we know that chris azrael des and noel went out into the woods and something horrible happened and that chris has changed ever since it's very likely when gaster chose chris to be his vessel for this particular experiment this is the most important point where Gaster has actually intervened in any kind of way, and this is all for his glorified experiment. This story would not be happening without Gaster's intervention. Otherwise, he is just an observer. Now then, there's a whole lot that could be puzzled out from his observations and from his interactions further down the line. Again, Toby is not showing us his whole hand here. We're only two chapters in. There's five chapters to go, and there's going to be a whole lot to be learned in those successive chapters. So we're going to have to see how things play out. But that's what we know of Gaster so far. He's most definitely an element here within the story. And that whole theme of determination definitely ties into our choices and how our choices shape who these characters become as the plot determinedly marches towards the seventh day and the end of the world. And it makes me think about actually the ending to uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows that Harry realizes that as he marches on to his death, what matters is how you approach that death. If you're going to die in the gladiator pit, are you going to be dragged out to be murdered, or are you going to march out onto those bloody sands head held high, and that you're going to fight for your life for, for whatever it's going to be, and you, might, and you might die? Your determination, your outlook, absolutely determines what that experience will be. And if it will be a rewarding one that leads to something better, or if you ultimately just give up. And so I think that that's really what, what Gaster and his story right here represent, which is a very heavy theme. And it's one that can be applied in very deep ways to the subject of making friends and what that friendship even means in the long run. All right, so now then let's jump on into... Uh, the last of these five darker stories right here, which is the story of Des. We actually don't know what's happened with Des. And this is something where people wonder, did she run away? Was she kidnapped? Is she dead? <laughs> Could she be the knight? <laughs> There's so many different theories about what's happened here with Des. And quite honestly, I'm going to argue this. It actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happened to Des, only that something bad happened happened that Des is no longer there and because Des is no longer there things began happening we know from looking at the newspaper clippings in the police station that Asgore basically was forced to resign in disgrace because he could not solve whatever happened to Des because that happened well things went bad for Asgore personally and it's one of those things that either that either hastened his divorce with Toriel and split the family, or might have been what started the whole chain of events that led to the divorce with Toriel and then split up the family. As a result of the family being split up, Azrael left. Azrael left town, went on to college into bigger and better things, leaving Chris alone. Chris feels abandoned, which is very important for Chris then becoming friends with Susie, and then slowly becoming friends with everyone else. However, Des's fate also heavily influenced the Holiday family and broke up that family. Not, not through a uh, divorce, but through an estrangement of the parents from each other and from their own child. I mean, Rudy is awesome. Rudy is really doing his absolute best to have a good relationship with his wife and with his daughter. But just but a good relationship cannot stand on one person alone. If there's two people involved in that relationship, both of them need to put in equal effort. 
And where there's a family involved, however many family members there are, that many people need to put in the effort to make the relationship work. So you have three people, and two of whom are not doing what needs to be done to make this relationship work. And as a result, it's falling apart. Why is it falling apart? Because something happened to Des, which sent Mrs. Holiday basically into a workaholic mode and has just been grinding everything down since then. And Noelle has completely receded into herself and isn't acting as who she once was. She has not been growing up properly, which has led in many ways to her fixation and her crush on Susie because Susie seems to embody this freedom that Noelle wants in her life. And I mean, that's important for Noelle, and that could lead to a really good relationship between her and Susie. But the thing is this, is that, that Noelle is definitely suffering. Noelle wants something. She wants someone else in her life to give her some sense of stability, especially as her father is languishing and deteriorating over in the hospital. So, yeah, uh, there's a lot of bad things going on there for the holiday and for the Dreamer family. And this spreads out actually to the rest of the community because Undyne doesn't feel worthy to be the successor of Asgore. She took over after he was forced to basically leave in disgrace from the police force. And with Undyne in charge, even though Undyne's a really great character, everything's kind of been falling into chaos ever since. The mayor is working herself to death, which is not good for the community. The community doesn't exactly know what to do with itself. It has a leader, as a strong leader, but that strong leader isn't working for the community. As a result, the community is also languishing and deteriorating just like her husband is. And this is just leading, this is just compounding so many other problems that are there within the community. The loss of one individual has put a stake through the heart of hometown. As a result of that, that gaping hole must be resolved, either through us discovering and resolving whatever happened to Des, or through making friends with everyone and stitching the community back together through honest, genuine friendship on the part of Chris and Susie. Otherwise, this whole community is going to fall apart just as the balance between worlds is falling apart. There is an imbalance thanks to whatever happened to Des. That is why this, this little side story from Noelle and about a character who we know basically nothing about other than that she's the older sister to Noelle and that she was really rough on Chris for teasing Noelle. Other than that, we don't know anything about Des and yet her loss is directly affecting everything. The fate of Des has determined the fate of hometown unless again determination steps on in and the actions of the player, of Chris, of Susie, and of Ralsey manage to change things around and save two worlds and the hearts and souls of hometown. So, whew, I know I've talked a lot right here. This is a lot to go over. Um, and you'll realize that a lot of it is still pretty theoretical. I mean, I could... I could put, totally put my hat on this and say 100% this is who the knight is. 100% this is what Gaster is doing. 100% Gerson and Alvin were there in the dark world. No, we don't fully know. I feel very confident in my theories and my analysis right here because I've spent months thinking about this stuff. It's one of the reasons why this video has taken so long to make. That, and I was working on a ton of other stuff. But hey, <laughs> there's a whole lot right here. And again, it's very theoretical. We're going to have to really dive deep into chapters 3, 4, and 5 once they are dropped to see where all of this leads. And chapter 3 is going to be, whew, that's going to be crazy. Well, once I'm done doing a video about, about Ralsei, I'm definitely going to kind of do my take on what I think will happen, at least in chapter 3. Beyond that, I have no idea what's going to happen. Toby really pulled the rug out from under me when it came to Chapter 2. The stuff that was happening in Chapter 2, like especially with Noel, I didn't think we were going to get to that until like Chapters 3, 4, 5. Like Chapter 3 at the earliest, but I was thinking 4 or 5. No, we got it right there in Chapter 2. So Toby can really shake things up right here. Uh, but that's some stuff still to look forward to, and I'm definitely going to get around to doing that. Hopefully, it won't take me half a year to, to get to those videos. I really do apologize for that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
But okay, let, let's let, let's though reel it all in. Again, really, why does all of this matter? What can we take away from these stories of two souls possessing Chris, or at least trying to determine the fate for Chris, and Chris is basically resisting against both of those souls? Uh, the fate of Des and what that matters, that Gerson Alvin went to the Dark World, that the Knight is very likely a friend of Father Alvin's, uh, and, and all of this stuff. What, what, does it, what does it matter? Well, again, you'll realize... That a lot of this stuff is just in the background. These are things that we can draw dot that we can draw lines between the dots, but it's not necessarily concrete. These are stories that are playing out in the background, but they all tie in to the characters. So let's think about this right here. The power of Delta Rune's plot is that it's all about Chris and Susie becoming friends and then becoming friends with everyone else, and how those friendships heal these individuals. It's the power of friendship, done in a very amazing way. Now then, if you had the power of friendship, oh yeah, and here's a dead sister, ha ha! Uh, that would be really hard to reconcile. It can be done, but now then, imagine the power of friendship. Here's a dead sister, and here's a disembodied core of consciousness who is trying to control us all through some deranged experiments. How do you put those three together if they're all sharing the stage at the forefront or they're at the front of the stage? You can't. That'd be too weird. Now you just keep on adding all these other elements on. If you make all of them so prominent, the story becomes convoluted and messy. Its tone would be here and there and everywhere. Toby wouldn't have the chance to give us the great humor that Deltarune is known for, or the great character development that this game is, is known for, or the friendships that we can build. You wouldn't have that. But that doesn't mean that you can't have these other stories playing out in the background. For many epic fantasy stories, stuff like the Stormlight Archive or Song of Ice and Fire, there are so many subplots that are happening. But they only take front and center when it becomes most important. And it's usually for a chapter or two, and then we move on, and then eventually you find out why that subplot was so relevant to the overall plot, and it just enhances the overall story. If you put too much plot all into one place, it just becomes so overbloated that it doesn't work. Toby understands this. There's a lot that he wants to do. There's a lot that he's trying to say within this story. I know a lot of people are like, he's just a troll. He's just messing with us. And yeah, that's, that's his personality. But as a fan of Brandon Sanderson, Sanderson is also a troll. I love the guy. Sanderson Senpai is a fantastic troll to the Cosmere community. <laughs> he, and that does not take away from the power of his storytelling. Same for Toby Fox. He likes to say and post a lot of weird things. And it makes people frustrated because he's like, what about your story, man? Well, yeah. The thing is this, is that he can still be a troll, but he can still then tell an awesome story by properly using all of these different elements and subplots at his disposal and really capitalizing on that. And that's why Deltarune is honestly an epic fantasy story. Because it is a fantasy story told through an amazingly large cast of brilliant and vibrant characters who are all dealing with their own character arcs, their subplots, and there are world-building subplots happening in the background that determine certain elements of the overall plot. This is a complicated story. This is one of the reasons why it's taking so long to make, because not only do you need to have the game mechanics to fit in all of this, but you need to make sure that the story actually works as well. This takes a lot of time. So I think that by understanding this, we can understand why the, the game of Deltarune is taking Toby so long to make. And then also by understanding these various elements, we can better understand just how important the core theme of the game is. That friendship matters that it's important to become friends with everyone that you determine who you're going to be friends with and that you seize those opportunities when they come and it's going to be amazing to see how this game wraps up because there's going to be so much that each of the characters learn even chris a lot of people could just kind of pass off chris as just like a, that's the vessel and our fan theories then give chris some sort of personality but in the game we realize that chris has loads of personality and and history 
and that Chris also as a person is growing through these experiences. It's just hard to understand that because many times it feels like we are the ones who are growing because we're the ones who are determining everything. But if we're paying attention to the story, paying attention to the dialogue and how things play out, it's very clear that Chris is also developing as an individual. So it's going to be really, really cool to see how everything is resolved in the end. So that is <laughs> that is my massive theory right here for these five darker storylines that are playing out in the background. And also why I think that they're so important because... Well, they help to enhance the power of the plot and the power of Deltarune's overall theme, and they give greater flavor and context to the different character arcs and experiences of Deltarune's fantastic and large cast. So, uh, let me know what you guys think. If you've made all the way to the end of this video, you have my respect. I know this is another very long one, and that's because there's just there's a whole lot to say about Deltarune. I'd love to know what you guys think about my observations, my analyses, and my theories regarding these five darker background stories. Let me know what you think, and also tell me if there's something that you've observed that I haven't, or if you have some uh, bits of information that either confirm or disprove what I have said here. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us on this adventure that we call writing. If you are a novice writer looking for for more advice or for direct help, please check out our, our links down below. You can check out our podcast. You can check out Pinterest. And you can also head on over to our subreddit or join our Discord. Links for all that and more are down in the description. So, thank you for joining us on this crazy long video and on this adventure that we call writing. And until the next video, y'all, you're not alone in the dark. Make some friends. It really matters. And choose.